Welcome, Hoosier fans, to another victorious episode of the Assembly Call as tonight your Indiana Hoosiers survive in overtime at home against the Penn State Nittany Lions, 87-85, to a game that the Hoosiers led by 12 at one point in the second half, but you know, when Penn State is down double digits in the second half to Indiana in Assembly Hall, it's like they have us right where they want us, and Penn State stormed back, took a lead at the end of overtime before Indiana was able to tie it there at the very end. Uh, and then during kind of a rumble, fumble, stumble of an overtime where neither team really played well, Indiana was able to make the final shot as Rob Finnessy knocks down uh, a, a jumper at the end of the shot clock to give Indiana the win and really avert disaster. Uh, you know, if Indiana loses this game, they start 0-3 in conference play, and I think there would have been a very warranted meltdown of Hoosier Nation. Uh, as it is, the Hoosiers are able to win able to push that meltdown off at least uh, one more game uh, and just give themselves a little bit of life in Big Ten play, move to 6-4. and four. So a very, very important win for Indiana tonight at home. I'm your host, Jared Morris. I am here with Andy Bottoms, Ryan Phillips, and special guest Scott Caulfield from Crimson Cast. We have a, a packed house for you here tonight. We're going to break it all down for you on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. And let's start this show the way that we start every show, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. And there's really only one place that you can go for the Banner Moment tonight. 85-85, 39.7 seconds to go. Indiana runs an offensive set that pretty much goes nowhere. But Rob Finnessy takes it into the lane, and with the shot clock running down, hits a nice turnaround jumper uh, at the end of the shot clock to give Indiana the lead at 87-85. And it was a return of Big Shot Rob, a guy who, you know, is known for hitting big shots, or at least was known, you know, back in previous seasons, has not really been that guy this season. And tonight, for the first time really all season, we saw some offense from Rob that we've been wanting to see. And, you know, what really impressed me about that last play there is that it was really a microcosm of the offensive success that he had in this game, which was taking what the defense gave him. You know, he struggled early, but then in the second half or at the end of the first half and then the second half was able to hit a couple of mid-range shots. That seemed to get him going. Uh, you know, found a, the, a lane to drive into a couple times, was able to knock down a three, you know, scored 11 points, easily his best offensive game of the night. And it felt for the first time like he was playing instinctive. Instinctive, taking what the defense gives him. That's what Rob does when he's at his best that's what he did tonight and he was able to come through in that big moment there at the end when Indiana really needed him to give the Hoosiers the victory all right our banner moment tonight as always brought to you by our friends at home field apparel now in their fourth season of sponsoring the assembly call and with winter here and hoodie weather officially arrived you need to make your way over to their website homefieldapparel.com they have something unique for everyone on your shopping list, especially IU fans, and all of their apparel is printed on the softest, most comfortable, most washable materials that you will find anywhere. If you want a few suggestions, I highly suggest, of course, the bison hoodie, which you need to have, and then really any of the hoodies or crewnecks because they're so comfortable. And as you can see that I'm wearing tonight, if you're watching the video, the new LEO Love Each Other shirt. That's right. Tonight, Indiana football, bringing good vibes to Indiana basketball as I just got my LEO shirt in the mail today. Wore it, and it is now 1-0 during basketball season. So I'm going to come and have to keep doing this until we lose. Uh, and remember, it's not just IU gear. If you have anyone on your gift list that maybe went to another school, home field may well have gear for them too because they serve fans from Akron to Xavier, Hawaii to Pitt, from Hope College to the Colorado School of Mines. Their designs are unique, interesting, and vintage. Uh, and you can save because you can use the promo code ASSEMBLY20 at checkout to get 20% off your entire order throughout the year. So go to homefieldapparel.com, load up your shopping cart, and enter ASSEMBLY20 at checkout to get 20% off your order. That's homefieldapparel.com. All right, well, it is time to move the ball, find the open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. And let's start with Ryan Phillips. Ryan, your rant on this Indiana victory. You know, uh, until about the buzzer, uh, I was not really happy about this game and our text thread, our show text thread probably showed that, but um, look, we'll get into that in the second segment and maybe a little bit later, but I, I want to, you know, give credit to the, the upperclassmen guards for pushing Indiana to a lead in, in the middle of the second half, getting them up there up by about 12. Now we're, we're going to go into how it's unacceptable that you're up 12 at home against Penn state, not Michigan state or, you know, whoever else, but Penn state and wind up going to overtime. It's unacceptable, but those guys showed something. They were challenged by their coach this week and they showed something. And quite frankly, for the balance of the game, Indiana was better when they were on the floor. 
Uh, and so that's something we haven't been able to really say that much this year. It, you, the guys you've been saying, well, we're better when he's on the floor have been Trace Jackson Davis, uh, Armand Franklin, sometimes Trey Galloway, depending on the game, Trey Galloway has made us better. Uh, and, and then I think that sometimes you could also say that most of the time about Ray Thompson. But tonight it was it was Durham and, and, and Rob Finnessy that Indiana played better with them on the floor, especially offensively. Now they ran into a hiccup late in the first, late in the second half, but in general, those guys were the reason that Indiana was able to get a comfortable lead. Then, of course, Penn State came storming back. But you have to give credit where it's due. Rob Finnessy made the big shot at the end, uh, and he made a couple of great shots during the game. Al Durham hit, you know, he was four or five from three at one point. They made some real clutch open shots. He missed a couple of clutch shots late. I wonder if fatigue had anything to do with it. He did play thirty five minutes, but he had a couple of real open ones later that he needs to knock down, but still you got four three pointers out of him. You got Rob Finnessy giving you 11 points, making having three blocks defensively. He was great defensively also had a tie up that led to a change of possession in a key situation. Uh, you know, you've got to give those guys credit because they were challenged by Archie Miller on his radio show this week. I'm sure they were challenged behind the scenes in practice for not giving this team anything. And they combined for 27 points. They gave something, and I thought that both of them played decent defense uh, on a team that was not playing great defense. I thought that they didn't stand out as being particularly poor, and I thought that that Finnessy, of course, made some big plays. So you have to give credit to the senior guards. Now, we'll talk about the the problems, the warts on this win, but I think, again, you just you have to give those guys credit for stepping up. And they combined, I'm sorry, for 29 points, not 27. Yeah, I, it's a good point on Rob. The defense at the end of uh, of regulation, he had two big plays that really prevented Penn State from extending that lead when they got it to seventy nine seventy eight. Uh, okay, let's go over to Andy Bottoms. Andy, your bottoms line on this Indiana victory. Uh, this this really tests the win is a win theory uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, it was a you know backs against the wall, those kinds of things. Uh, early must win game, whatever you want to say. I think the the challenge is that you you can look at some positives from this. It was a, uh, a get right game a bit for, um, for, for Rob and Al as, uh, as, as Ryan mentioned. And so that was, that was a positive. You had a lot of guys being able to contribute. Um, but then you look, and I mean, this team gave up 1.52 points per possession in the second half. Now that doesn't count overtime. Um, but I mean, that's, that's awful against anybody. Um, doesn't really matter who it is. And I, he was really getting spread out and struggled on that end of the floor. And then let look tired by the end of the game, because, you know, that was a stretch there offensively where I, you had it rolling. I think they scored an eight straight possessions and the pace slowed down a little bit, uh, on offense and, and things really went South after that. And as much as Archie talks about wanting to continue to give other guys minutes, seven guys played after halftime and Lander hardly played in the first half because of foul trouble with and, and defensive issues and Geronimo, played a little bit because he had to uh but this team depth is just continuing to to rear its head with this team and it gets uh a little bit tougher and tougher and, and guys look really tired a lot of shots left short uh as you went down the stretch of the game uh but but like ryan said you know kudos to rob for for making a play on an offensive set that as you said i don't really even know other than trace try to fake the guy out so you can come out and get the ball i, I have no idea what the uh you know what the what the plan was there to really free him up and get him the ball. Uh, so Rob bailed him out, and they they got a Big Ten win, and and hopefully that's something that they can springboard uh, from. But man, it's it's hard to feel great uh, after a, a after a performance like that, even though there were positives to the game and, and positive contributions from a lot of guys um, because of how much they were able to score, and quite frankly, how terrible Penn State's defense was. Um, but. I, I, this kind of effort is not going to win very many Big Ten games at all uh, in this season, for sure. Well said. All right, let's bring in special guest Scott Caulfield. Scott, your thoughts on this Indiana performance? Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. I mean, you know, when you win a game against one of the worst teams in the Big Ten by two in overtime, like, you got to bring out the four-man panel. Like, it's time to bring in special <laughs> guests. Like, this is a huge moment for IU. No, I was... I was thinking, um, you know, if we had lost, I was ready to just, you know, pr- ask you if I could just cuss on the air and just let's get it over with. But I was thinking, what do I talk about if we win? This is even before the game and I saw the game went down. But I, I thought about this and this really hits home is that you know, I have a son 
who's seven, about to turn eight years old, that he comes home with homework, you know, as a second grader does a little bit. And he has to do like a math worksheet and has like five rows of math. And like, he has to read for 10 minutes, or I'd like him to do that. And the days he wants to play video games or when he wants to like, you know, play out with his friends, he will do exact, he'll set a timer on his echo for 10 minutes. And then he'll do like the five, like the five math problems he has to no more, like the bare effing minimum. Um, And he's like, I'm going to go play. And and that's kind of to what Andy's saying. Like that is what this game and this win was like, this is the absolute bare minimum that you need to do. And like, we can, there's some positives. I'm not here to be that guy. So we can push, push the ball aside when you want to talk positives. But I mean, as Andy said, this is not going to get it done. Like this was, this was a game that you could have at least gotten some kind of momentum. I guess you get a little bit, but like this was the bare minimum. And to Andy's point of them looking tired, I, I know, I mean, I know what it is. I know it's marketing, but it's like, I never want to see another video of them just busting ass and working out before the season again. And like, Oh, we're killing it. Like, Oh, we're running upstairs and we're flipping tires. It's like, stop. Like, I want to like, how about you just look like you're fresh in an overtime against Penn state when you're like three games into the big 10. Like, I don't know. I, I have a friend who texts me that whenever he sees those videos, and like every time I see him flip a tire, I think they're going to miss five more threes during the season. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's what this game is. Like this is the bare minimum. Penn state's not a good team. Like by all metrics, they're not a very good team. Um, our defense did not look good tonight, but yeah, it's, it's the bare minimum. This is, I did my five math problems. I read exactly nine minutes and 59 seconds. I want to go play video games now. Playing the role of coach tonight and railing against these social media videos is Scott Caulfield. <laughs> Uh, that's a lot in common, actually. Now that yeah. I no, I mean, look, I, I will say, you know, there are this game did remind me of last year's game against Nebraska when, you know, we had to go to overtime against Nebraska. And that Nebraska team was like 150th in Ken Palm. This Penn State team, you know, they are one of the worst teams in the Big Ten, but it is a really loaded Big Ten where what 13 teams are in like the top 55. So it's not a horrible Penn State team, and they've played other Big Ten teams close, and they beat Virginia Tech. So they are not terrible. That said, the way that Indiana played for most of the night felt terrible. you know. And, and so you're right, Scott. Indiana did the absolute bare minimum that they needed to do tonight. But, you know, look, I think we've got to start out talking about the defense. Because, Please let's. I, you know, I will. I will say, like when there were some defensive plays that needed to be made at the end of the game, Rob Finnessy made a few. Indiana got a stop there at the end, so that was good. But this is a team that, and a program that wants to hang its hat on defense. They were top ten. You know, the new Ken Palm rankings are out. I think they dropped to fifteenth on defense. That's actually not quite as far as I thought that they would drop. But you know, Andy, when you watch this game play out. You know, what do we know about Penn State coming into this game? You know, they're very limited offensively. They don't go inside a lot. They shoot a lot of three-pointers, you know, and there are certain guys that you just got to make them put the ball on the deck, you know, and, and a guy like Sessoms, you know, you've got to make sure that you guard him in the right way. And, you know, every now and then with Archie Miller teams, it feel you know, we know that they do scouting reports. Like, we know they do that in practice, but there are some games it feels like they don't carry any of it out onto the court. And that's what tonight felt like in addition to just Penn State kind of understanding how to get the pack line defense running around in circles. And so it felt very reminiscent of some other Indiana home games where the defense just hasn't shown up and has been really vulnerable, you know, and a team that came into the game and you're thinking, okay, we should be able to handle these guys. They have basically picked apart every vulnerability. And we saw that and Indiana didn't really have any answers, you know, except for a few possessions at the end of regulation over time when they absolutely had to have it. So again, I give them credit for that, but overall, you know, Indiana's not going to score 80 plus points very often. This kind of defensive effort is going to get Indiana beaten most nights. Yeah, there were a, a few things to to call out. And I know I know Ryan has uh, strong opinions on these based on him uh, for a long stretch of time, just texting himself because no one, <laughs> none of the rest of us would respond. I it did a lot of like, that I like, I like it, it a little bit coping to the, mechanism. Uh, I likened it a little bit to like the whole uh, notion of like the Creed Thoughts uh, blog on the office where he just opened up a Word document so he could write <laughs> stuff down. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, a couple things. I think the way Penn State plays, they do want to shoot a lot of threes. They play a smaller four man uh, and, and they really try to space you out. And that was something similar to what you saw at Northwestern do. And, you know, the, the difference for me in this game was in the, even in the Northwestern and the Illinois games, you had stretches where the defense played poorly, but it wasn't nearly for as prolonged a stretch as it was tonight. 
And and I think part of that was that the way they treated some of the ball screens was was odd, although they shifted it a little bit later, um, you know, to really assume the guy was going to reject the screen, essentially. But, you know, a lot of times they really get strung out. You've got a guard tagging a big guy inside who then either has a really long closeout to get to a three point shooter at the arc or is trying to block out essentially Hera in in most of the cases and gave up some offensive rebounds that way. So. It, it was just 13 seemed, of them, Andy, 13 offensive rebounds. Well, I don't know that we can say all 13 were the result of that, but never mind. But, uh, but, but I think, um, so, so that seemed odd given some of the switching that they had done at, at various points over the course of the year, um, to play it a little bit differently against Penn state. Presumably that's something they saw on film that they felt like was the right way to play them, but it really was something that, um, struggle for IU. And I thought Robbie Hummel even brought it up with one of the, I think it was Armand who was having to close out. He got, he, I mean, he just said he has a ton of ground to cover to get out to the shooter, uh, in that scenario. And so I just seemed like kind of an odd choice and a bit slow to adjust to, to how Penn state was doing that. But you know, this is, you know, for whatever it's worth, you know, this is modern college basketball getting, you know, shooters outside, putting guys in pick and roll actions and trying to have shooters to kick it out to. And, that's how a lot of people play it. You know, Penn state probably erred more on the side of, you know, jacking threes than, than some other teams might. But, but again, it seems similar to me to the way that Northwestern really tried to space IU out. And, and again, at that point, you've got guys running everywhere to try to, you know, recover to where they need to be and then get back out to shooters. And um, I, you really struggle with that, whether it was uh, you know, the individual decisions that players are making or just the, the, the scheme itself. Yeah. I mean, let's be real. It, India had no answer for ball screen defense. And we saw this last year at times when Joey Bronk was playing was they would over hedge. He wouldn't be able to recover to his guy and it would either be a dunk or somebody else would have to step up and help leaving their man wide open on the perimeter. Then even if that guy doesn't shoot a three, you're closing out really hard to get to him because he might and he drives right by you. I mean, it's and that was what it looked like tonight was, and you have Trace Jackson Davis out there and Race Thompson out there who are quick at recovery, but repeatedly they would hard hedge that ball screen and it would throw the entire defense off like it had never seen a reversal off a hard ball screen before. And and, and so at some point, you've got to change the coverage on that. You can't just let it repeatedly beat you for 40 minutes, which it did tonight. That's on Archie. He's got to change and say, okay, let's just switch that ball screen. Even if it's Trace Jackson Davis on a shooter, the other way isn't working. Maybe his length will help, and maybe then at some point in the offense, you can switch back to the big guy when the ball is not on your side of the floor or something. You've got to change the coverage on that. You cannot just allow yourself to get beaten by the same thing over and over and over just because that's your system. Like If your system isn't working, change it. Like it's just, it's, it's, it's maddening. And I get that Archie is very dedicated to the pack line and he wants to hard hedge and he wants to do those things. But earlier in the year, they were switching everything and it was working. And then all of a sudden over the last two games, they've gone back to that hard hedge that worked at times last year, but also got beaten quite often by teams that could shoot Penn state going in. You knew was a team that could shoot and you went back to it. And then 10 minutes into this game, they should have been like, all right, no, we're switching back. Just switch everything. Just switch on the perimeter, help each other out, communicate, and you could switch back. They didn't. And what happened all game is they got beaten off of reversals, wound up giving guys great driving lanes and wide open shots. And so at some point, you've got to change what you're doing. You've got to alter it. You've got to make changes within the game. As a coach, you have to read the game. Coach, if he was here, would tell us that. You have to read the game and make changes. And he didn't do that all night. He got lucky that Rob Finnessy and some other guys made some indiv- great individual plays late. I'll give Armand Franklin credit too a little bit for helping out and and uh, and knocking a ball loose at one point. And, you know, I mean, guys were making great individual plays. But what Penn State did and what every team from now on, if they're playing Indiana, will do, spread the floor with shooters, get into driving lanes, make the help come, and kick and reverse it one more time and you will find an open shooter or individual pick and roll at the top of the uh, top of the key and either hit the roll man or kick it to the corner because somebody will be wide open. That is what every team in the big 10 should do to attack Indiana because tonight Indiana proved it can't guard it. It can't guard it. The, The guys who have been in this system for years don't have an answer for it. And so at some point you've got to fix that. If you're Archie Miller, you can't just say, well, this is our system. We're going to stick with it. 
To be fair, I do think Indiana that, I did do think enter tonight's game with pretty good three point defense so far on the season. So this is the first time it's this is the first time it's been that bad. And you're Agreed. gonna have some bad and, nights. So I just want to throw that out. There. To the, they switched back to the hard over hedging yes. two yes. games ago. And so it's it's changed. Now they were hedging under the shooters before just to kind of do a little show until the guy could recover. Now that's also on the guy, not just on the hedger, but it's also on the guy who's getting screened to fight through and get there fast. So he doesn't have to hold as long, but you had trace Jackson Davis jumping all the way out tonight. So he's, you know, perpendicular to the ball, to the ball handler. I mean, that's what we saw last year that didn't work all season. And now we're back to it and you can't do that. Teams are just going to exploit it. I mean, against yeah. bad teams, you can do that. Against good teams, they're going to beat you, especially teams that have the threat of hitting a three-point shot. Teams could do that against Indiana. All right, Andy. Last point on the defense. Yeah, I think I think two other two other things. One, we saw the freshman in particular, although it wasn't unique to the freshman, really continue to struggle with closeouts and are just getting attacked on those. I mean, Lander committed, I think, both of his fouls that way. Um, Galloway has struggled with that. I think that's what you'd expect from some of the freshmen, but you also see you got to find ways to keep the ball in front of you. It doesn't really matter what your, what your coverage is. If you can't keep the ball in front of you, because even in other times, you know, they would just get in isolation situations where they would just, you know, try to uh, try to get to the rim. And there's a number of guys again, that just, I mean, every time Jerome Hunter sky gets the ball, he's going to drive right at him. I mean, the, the book is out on enough of the, of the guys here where there's just a handful of, of guys who want it from a scouting report standpoint from the other teams is going to be like, you get the ball and this dude's on you drive them. So th- there's other things to do it, that, that need to get better. Not just the ball screen coverage. Like that is not the end all be all of figuring out what, what needs to happen. But um, those were the other couple things where you just got, again, you're not playing a lot of guys and then you got young guys who you're asking to go in and play minutes and they're really struggling to close out under control and contain somebody. And then that just gets you in rotation all over again with somebody trying to step in and help. This IU team blows on defense. <laughs> Galen, that is unfair. That's unfair. This is still, this is still a solid defense. We had to have Galen here. If Scott's going to be here. Um, okay. So let, let's end this segment talking about the offense because as frustrated as we are with the defense tonight, and you know, I, I think it's warranted, even though again, this is still this is still a good defense. Maybe not the elite or great defense that we thought it was, you know, a few games ago, but it's still a very good defense. Offensively, you know, we saw some things to like tonight. Notably, Al Durham and Rob Finnessy getting it going. Obviously, they had been called out by their coach. Uh, you know, we talked about Rob. I thought from Al tonight. We saw the things that we need to see from Al, which is basically Al Durham's got to go out and produce points. He's going to give up some stuff on defense. He's going to make two or three decisions every game that result in turnovers and leave you shaking your head. But he's got to compensate for that with his scoring. And he did it tonight. 18 points. He came out looking for a shot, looking to drive, uh, and, and really, I thought, did a nice job and also had four assists. You know, So he did a nice job tonight. The other thing that really stood out for me offensively was how important Trey Galloway was in Indiana's half court offense. I mean, for most of the night, he was Indiana's best facilitator in the half court. That is a credit to him because I think it shows that he's really improved just in the, what have you played? 10 games this season. He's gone from a guy who was completely out of control driving into the lane to now a guy who drives much more under control is much better at picking his spots for when to pass and when to go up and try to finish. And tonight finishes with 10 points, five assists, and you saw in the second half there was a stretch where you know he was creating all kinds of looks. He goes out, and the offense just kind of fell apart for a few possessions. And again, on the one hand, that's a real credit to him. On the other hand, we're going to be in trouble if that doesn't change. You know, and so that's where guys like Rob have to step up, and, and other guys are going to have to step up and be, you know, be better playmakers. But I thought, Scott, tonight there were some things from the offense – that you know we can take if we start to see him in future games you know maybe we can look back on this as you know kind of one of those slump busters that got a few guys going and i'm checking my notes there was a couple plays in the second half where galloway was really the only guy who could get jackson davis the ball and wasn't just like a set play like he had a couple of little you know (laughs) two man like pick and pops where he's getting the ball to him and it's not just you know fantasy dunking it into him like he's able to get you know davis and the ball in a good spot but the the thing that i would say about al durham like I love to see it. It's great. But like I was looking at it, like, you know, four for eight from three, that's the most threes he's hit in his career in a game. If you took this game and put it into his junior season, just plugged it in the season, that'd be 10% of the threes that he made all last year. He hit 36 last year. So he'd have 40 with this game in there. And four for 40 is 10% because my kid does half of his math. So, I mean, he does the bare minimum math. I know that. Um, 
And so, yeah, I'm proud of my, proud of my boy too. You know, th- that is, uh, it's good. Like tonight was good. I, I, I'm going to stay positive for a sec. Like I love the progression of Armand Franklin. Like he just looks aggressive. Like in the last post game that Galen was on, with the Illinois one, like him and Andy talked a lot about just like the, you know, being um, aggressive. And he's the only one who seems to look like he's aggressive the entire game. There's stretches where guys kind of lock in like, hey, this works. And it's like, all right, now we're going to go to being passive again and like not going to do it. But this goes to a larger problem where it's like, this just doesn't feel sustainable. Like, I just don't know if we're going to get four threes and 18 points out of Al Durham. And honestly, he should have had five or six. Like in the in the overtime, he missed an open three. Um, and then he, I think his guy hit a three, then he missed another open three. Like he, he had, had some that, that rimmed out, but it's progress because he had been missing left and right. And tonight his misses yeah. were right on. And yeah, so he fixed something. In, the second one in overtime was online. It was in and out. One thing I want to say you, before we get too far away from this, you mentioned yeah. that Trey Galloway was the only one finding th- that Trace Jackson. There was one time where Trace Jackson Davis got the ball on the left side, top of the key from somebody dribbled directly at Trey Galloway handed him the ball, rolled to the basket, and got a pass from him. He was like, nope, this guy gets me the ball. I'm getting – like, it didn't even look like he was part of the offense. He just dribbled over, handed it to him, and then spun and rolled, and Trey gave it to him. It was just – it was very much just like, ah, I know where my, my bread is buttered. It's right here, and I'm going and giving you the ball. It was – I mean, and, and good for Trace. He should do that. And, uh, yeah, so I just thought that was – you made a great point about Galloway getting him the ball and and – you know, Trace uh, obviously saw that too. Yeah. But, I mean, but th- so this is like when the team is doing well like this, like that's what's good. The thing with the offense that drives me nuts is like there was a point in the first half we were up. Let me look at it. It was we're up 14 to eight. You know, if we're anything close to a point for possession at the big start of the game, we're up 24, maybe 26 to eight. And this game is over. I mean, they, we, we've we've now like Penn State felt like they were in it for most of the game because we we really outplayed him the first five or seven minutes, but we're only up by six points as Nobody opposed can to make being a shot. Up. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's, it's just, it doesn't feel completely sustainable, but no, for tonight, you know, it's a good game. You, you, you got the game you wanted out of Durham. You had some great plays out of fantasy, like that, you know, like you put him in the banner moment. The thing that I would say on that last play, it's like, I do wonder, I wrote down, it's like Penn state kind of blew up what we were trying to do, but it's like, the reason that we were then stuck with a fantasy kind of fadeaway is because the play started with him just bouncing the ball for 10 seconds and nobody moving. And like Jackson Davis being like, I'm going to go up. No, I'm not. And it's like, I, I, I'm not, we're not doing a two for one here. Like, I'm not sure why, why the play is like, we're going to do, you know, they, they go for the, the you know, race had a, uh, a screen and like a back cut for, for J- Jackson Davis on the backside. It's like, it didn't work. And then it's like, all right, well now we have three seconds. I got nothing to do. It's like, well, you could have had 13 seconds if you didn't just, you know, dribble the ball for 10 extra seconds. But I think, yeah, that's, that's I what I got. The worst thing about this offense that I see happen a lot is they come across half court and immediately everyone looks to Archie for a play. And then it takes a second for everyone to get situated. And then they have to run through the first action. And by the time they actually get the play going and you move the ball, 15, 20 seconds are off the clock. It's like that play should be called while you're in the backcourt, or you should rely on your players to make their own decisions and, and call a play. And if you empower the player, maybe he makes, make some decisions, but it feels like a lot of times Rob or, or Franklin or uh, Durham brings the ball up. And then they immediately look over to Archie like, okay, what are we running? And it's like, you should already know what you're running by the time you're there because that can get everyone in position when you get across half court. So I I just think that that is a problem. It's like college football where they they do that Uh pre-snap thing where they fake like they're going to snap it and then they stop and the whole team turns to the sidelines. Like that doesn't work in basketball. You've only got 30 seconds to get it off and everyone's got to get in position. So I, mean, I want to see Archie with the big sign that has like Whataburger and the Geico lady. I'd be and like fine with that. Things and just like flipping up the cards and yeah, the card up the, the- yeah, the, yeah, the four random things. Uh, here's a Waffle House, the Tiger King, uh, a Buick yeah. LeSabre. Bob and, Barker. You know, we've all, like, we, we've come full circle. We made fun of the echo signs and now we're calling for signs on the sidelines. It's but all it's, it, you know, if he's holding world, that though. up when they're in the if he's holding that up when they're in the backcourt, they can see it and know where they're going instead yeah. well, of just and the, coming and the across person, and stopping. To go on to this, like again, the aggressiveness. I think the person this has hurt the most is unfortunately Rob Fantasy. Like you see it, like he just doesn't look like half the time he's not playing instinctively. Like there was one play in the first half where he drove in, he's going up for a layup, and then just like kind of just like goes and tries to pass it to Jackson Davis, like knocked away. It's like 
it's like, dude, just play basketball. He's, you could see it. He's so in his own head. And I don't think the overcoaching is helping him because it's, he's just like, just dude, go play basketball. Like stop thinking. Yeah. Well, when he, you can tell when his brain turns off and he just plays and it's, it's much better than when he's thinking. All right. Yeah, last thought, Andy, stretch, then we'll move on. Yeah. That's stretch in the second half. I mean, this all, all ties together when they, when they played with some good pace and got into stuff quickly and really was more on the fly. I, that was when they, again, they scored eight possessions in a row. I mean, I'm not telling you that, you know, on a couple of those, they may not look toward the sideline, but there was like a, a defined flow to what was happening and a pace and a crispness to what they were trying to do on offense that just went away uh, at times. I thought Galloway was, was a big part of that. I think that was probably the stretch that, that you mentioned where he was really getting, getting guys involved and was aggressive and attacking, making passes, but there's just too much. Uh, yeah. There's, I, I would hate to punish myself and go back to look at how many possessions does nothing really happen until there's less than 15 seconds on the shot clock. It, it was a lot. Uh, and my family could attest that I kept yelling about it uh, during various points of the game. And, and Galloway did that. He got sucked into that one of the times too, where, you know, he dribbled around and I think eventually turned the ball over or they, they, yeah, up there was shot. one position. It wasn't, it, it's not even, even for a guy who did well during stretches, like he struggled with the same thing. And, it just makes you wonder whether is that the play calls, whatever. It just seems systemic that you're eating up large chunks of that. And then at the same time, when the offense is a bit more free flowing is when it actually it looks and is the most successful. By the way, coach is feisty in the chat tonight. I feel like we're missing a vintage coach performance tonight on the show. You dumbass. I don't like carrot. Okay. Well, there's some feisty coach drops. All right. Uh, coming up here on the assembly call as we continue our breakdown of Indiana's victory over Penn state. We will point out tonight's meaningful moments that you might have missed, and then we will go inside the numbers to highlight the most important statistical notes from this game and talk about much, much more. You're listening to The Assembly Call. Stick with us. Hi, this is James Blackman Jr., I never miss an open three, and I never miss an episode of The Assembly Call. Join Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosier. That's IU Penn State game legend James Blackman Jr. there for you. Thank you, James. You are listening to The Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I'm Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms, Ryan Phillips, and Scott Caulfield breaking down Tonight's 87-85 victory for Indiana over Penn State. And it's time, guys, to talk about tonight's meaningful moments that you might have missed. I want to talk about one with Armand Franklin here in just a minute. But, you know, for me, there are two that really, really stick out. And, you know, one of them happened with four minutes left to go in the first half. Indiana got that five-point play where Al Durham hits the three-pointer. Penn State gets a technical foul. Al makes the free throws. The Hoosiers are up 29-20. to and it really feels like they've got a chance to push this lead out against Penn State, take some real momentum into halftime. And immediately, Penn State goes down, makes a three. Then Armand coughs up a turnover, fouls the guy in transition. They score, quick 5-0 run. They're right back into it. And so we squander that lead. Then again, it happened in the second half. You know, the, the Al Durham, Rob Finnessy offensive explosion where those guys go off. Indiana's up 12. You know, all their teammates are hugging them and everybody's excited. And it feels like, okay, we can exhale a little bit. You know, now we're up by 12. We'll coast to victory. No, Penn State almost immediately erased that lead and, of course, ended up taking a lead in regulation. And, you know, Andy, to me, that was one of the most maddening things about tonight and just you know, and really, and this isn't just a thing with this year's team. This has been just a, a recurring issue with Archie Miller teams, especially at home, which is, you know, when Indiana's playing a team that they're ranked better than, they have more talent than, like they're better than Penn State, but they just let these teams back into the game and they make it so much harder than it needs to be. And look, these are, you know, scholarship athletes too. They're, it, the, Penn State is a good team. They're going to make a run and they're going to come back, but it's like, it's like Indiana makes it too easy. And it's almost like clockwork that you can see it happen. Like they, they make these some great plays, they get on a big run, and then they kind of relax and stop doing the things they were doing to go on the run. And those two times just really stick out because it's like, hey, you've got a chance to extend a lead on these guys. We don't. And that's what separates this team and this program right now from kind of being mediocre to good and maybe being really good. You got to be able to extend leads on teams at home when you have a chance and Indiana doesn't do that. We end up in too many of these dogfight games at home. 
Well, and another time that happened, I used up 77-68 with four minutes and eight seconds left, and Penn State ripped off eight points to, to get back in it, where, again, you kind of felt like you could exhale. You're up nine with about four minutes left and you know, let your foot off the gas a little bit, whatever whatever you want to say, and just not really be able to, to do that. And that's that's been, you know, Archie's talked about that as well. You know, how do you finish games? And, and it just continued to, there were a, a ton of opportunities in the first half to really extend the lead. I think Scott brought one up earlier. And I think that was, was another one was just really like, can you get that one stop? Can you get that defensive rebound to, to really, really push the lead out and build on that momentum? Um, the second half, when you talked about, like I said, I felt like they really came out and then slowed things down offensively and scored, you know, they'd scored eight possessions in a row and then they score one, one out of five trips after that, you know, Penn state's defense didn't dramatically get better uh, for that one stretch of the, of the game. Uh, But, but again, it was, you know, Penn state, give them some credit. They were able to hit open threes. It's something um, I, you can continue to struggle with. I wrote down a moment where, you know, we had a wide open three on one end. We missed it. They have a contested three on the other end and make it. And it's like, sometimes it's, it's just that, that simple, I guess, but I, I don't know what it is about the team that, that kind of can't get those next couple plays to really extend the lead. Although, then to your point, you felt like you started to see it in the second half where things really started to roll downhill and it gets to be a 12 point lead and out of the timeout, give up a three and, and, and really struggle to score for the next, next two, three minutes and, um, and, and let him back in. And that was, a, a, you know, in a game I use offensive numbers are off the charts, but you still had those lulls where, um, allowed them to hang around, but it was, you know, really more the defense tonight than anything. The other thing I want to talk about Ryan is Armand Franklin, who, you know, I talked about there in that first moment, you know, where he kind of coughed up a turnover and that's the real blemish on this game tonight for Armand, which is four turnovers. And a lot of the turnovers just came from sloppy ball handling, frankly, you know, a guy trying to kind of dribble and do too much. Should have been five too. It should have been. What I will say is, I'm not mad at the turnovers because we can't have it both ways. We can't ask Armand as a sophomore who's still evolving into a go-to offensive player to be aggressive and be this go-to guy producing points, but, oh, don't ever turn the ball over. Now, clearly, he's got to work on his ball handling He has to and his decision-making. Like He has to work that out. But to me, these turnovers aren't as much carelessness or sloppiness as they are a guy who's going from being a low usage player to being a high usage player who maybe doesn't quite have the ball handling skills yet to handle it kind of trying to feel his way through it and if if that's the price that we have to pay for his 16 points and really assuming the role of go-to offensive guy you know Rob and Al did it tonight but Armand's the one who's been doing it every game I will live with those turnovers from him already seeing how much he's grown full well knowing that he'll He'll get better at that. So that jumps out on the stat sheet. It jumped out watching the game, but it's not something that concerns me. Yeah, and and with Armand, it's just that's the next phase of his game he needs to work on. He's worked on his offense. He's worked on his shooting. He's become a lockdown defender. The next thing he needs to clean up is his ball handling and and all of his turnovers. He's had a couple of the last couple of games where they're from dri- dribbling in traffic on on the break. He's turned. He's had some bad turnovers on the break where. He dribbles it and he tries to make a move, not knowing where the defender is going to position himself. Defender steps right in front of him. He dribbles the ball off a defender's leg, off his leg, off, you know, because he's he's going too fast and doesn't have enough control of his handle to to make a move on the guy. And, you know, he sh- again, he had four tonight, should have had five. He dribbled the ball off of Trace Jackson Davis's leg that Indiana got a call on um, that was clearly off Trace Jackson Davis's foot. Uh, but yes, he, he needs to clean that up. But again, you can't be mad. I mean, Look at Armand tonight. He had 16 points and only one three-pointer. So this was a lot of driving, a lot of getting inside, a lot of aggressiveness. And if a guy is going to be aggressive like that, you can't be mad when occasionally it doesn't work out because the alternative is a guy who is not aggressive. And you need him to be aggressive and score and, and get points. And, you know, late in the second half, he, or I don't know if it was super late, but in the second half, he made a couple drives that were huge for the momentum of this game by finishing in close and keeping Indiana, you know, be a one point game. He made it a three point game and, you know, you feel a little bit safer because you know, well, at least all Penn state could do is tie it. And you kind of felt like they were going to every time, but he's a guy who just has, has certainly upped his game and give him credit. He made all five of his free throws too. When he, when he stepped to the line and free throw shooting, not his strong suit last year, he certainly improved that. Um, So, yeah, I think that the turnovers are concerning and a lot of it is 
just take a breath, slow down because you're not at the point yet, especially when you're, you know, dribbling up the court, not necessarily in the half court, but if you are on the break, slow down sometimes if there are multiple defenders in front of you because you're you're not at a point yet where you can get through those guys. So he just has to sort of, that's his next evolution is figuring out what to do in those situations. Yeah, he'll get better. And look, in the second half, you know, once once Rob and Al kind of tailed off offensively, it was the Trace and Armand show. And they really carried Indiana offensively yep. there at the end of regulation. You know, Armand driving, being aggressive. You know, this was a guy who was the 150th ranked recruit. He is Archie's lowest ranked recruit that, that Archie has brought in. He is not a guy who was supposed to be your go-to offensive player as a sophomore, you know. And that's look, it, it's part of the reason why this team is offensive, cha- offensively challenged. It's not a knock on him because he's playing far better than anyone could have expected. It's just the fact that he's had to pick up so much extra slack for other guys who either haven't developed or who have gone through struggles. And so, you know, with a guy like that, we're going to have to deal with a few of these growing pains. But goodness gracious, you know, he shows so much toughness and so much heart. And he's the guy, you know, when Penn State would go on, you know, some of those runs that I talked about and they would maybe, you know, get it down to two or four points and kind of threaten to take the lead, who would step up and make a three or who would step up and drive to the and get a bucket? Like Armand, he only had 16 points tonight. But, you know, Scott, I looked at that at the end of the game. I was like, he only had 16 because it felt like every shot he had was a big one, was an important one. And his evolution into that guy who wants to be that is huge. You know, and throw the recruiting rankings out the window because he's showing he was better than that and he's only going to keep getting better. And, and so I think, you know, for a lot of the people, you know, want more offense run through him. And but look, I, I agree. He's a guy who needs to have the ball more and he's showing, you know, he may not be fully ready for the higher usage with some of those turnovers, but he's showing that in terms of his ability to produce despite the turnovers, he can do it. And Indiana has had to have it so far this year from him. Yeah, I mean, to your point, I'm fine with turnovers if you're being aggressive, and that's what they're coming from. I mean, and you know, people who want him to use them, he's he's second most on this on this team, and you know, usage rate. He has 22 percent of usage on 20 uh, percent of possessions are going through him, second most on the team, only to Jackson Davis, and that's kind of where it should be. But no, there there was a point in the second half where we're up 47, 46, and Penn State misses a three. Franklin comes down, breaks his guy down, drives, gets fouled, hits two free throws. He does have a little too much help and then his guy hits a three but then he comes back down breaks him down dunks uh, has a great dunk and it's unfortunately a part like that was great by him it's unfortunately a part where like then you know fantasy hits a three Durham hits a three and a little bit later we're up 66 54 and then to your point you know it's like we still can't put it away we let Penn State back in but no I mean Franklin is our number two offense I mean our number two option on offense I think the trouble is like we've like you guys have talked about in the last three or four games is you know tonight we won because we had some really good number three options come together it's just I don't think any of us can comfortably say all right I can just go ahead and pencil an Al for 15 every game moving forward and I know we're going to get another 10 or 15 out of Rob Fantasy you know it's like we need if we could get those guys if we could kind of turn Fantasy um, Al Durham and Franklin into kind of a three headed monster to be our number two, kind of all three of them are a number two and three built together, then, then we're great. Um, but the problem is, you know, as you said, like Franklin is a sophomore, he's only, you know, 26% into his career right now, but no, he, he's doing great. It's everything you, you'd want him to do. And he's been, he's been fantastic. Scott's just showing off with his math at this point now, calculating it's, the the percentage. It's a theme. <laughs> Andy, what moment jumped out to you? Yeah, I, I didn't mark exactly when this happened, although there are multiple times that it did. I, I, I and I think Galen and I talked about this after the Illinois game, or, or maybe it was the maybe it was the Northwestern game. Um, and, and I put this both on the the other players and Trace, but there continue to be times where he gets a smaller guy switched onto him, especially which would happen a fair amount tonight, just given Penn State's lack of size, and they continue to struggle to get him the ball. And in some of the cases, he doesn't really move to give an angle for the pass. Uh, to, to be there. So it isn't one-sided in that regard, but for everybody who's kind of watching these games, beating the drum of getting him the ball more, Robbie Hummel was saying that a lot tonight, there continue to be some missed opportunities with doing that. And, and again, I'm not sure if that comes from trying not to make a mistake, if that comes from, um, you know, again, I think sometimes it's him not giving them a great angle. There was one on the wing where race, was looking at him, but he just wasn't in any position to really get him the ball. And so again, for a team that's going to struggle offensively, anytime you've got a guy without a ton of size on trace, you've got to find a way to get him the ball. 
uh, particularly in those scenarios. I thought Galloway did a decent job of, of that uh, at times, but that, that continues to be a, a frustration on offensive night where things largely went well. Uh, but if you look at how other teams might start playing IU, if you can get those mismatches, it, it just need to, it feels like they need to take better advantage of it. So I know it happened a couple of times. I didn't have a specific one, but uh, fair to a reasonable time to bring that up. We'll allow it. That counts. Appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> all right, guys, let's talk numbers, uh, numbers that jump out to you. You know, I think the big one coming into this game, if Indiana was going to win this game, they were going to need to have an advantage at the free throw line because you expected Penn State to have an advantage from three point range. That certainly happened as Penn State made 12 three pointers to Indiana six. But the Hoosiers were able to compensate by making 17 free throws while Penn State only shot 15. And that has always been a good formula for success. You make more free throws than your opponent shoots. So that was certainly good for Indiana. Uh, on the concerning side is Indiana giving up 13 offensive rebounds, which we've talked about. Indiana only got four of their own. Rebounding continues to be an issue for this team. And I'll tell you, this to me is, is the place to bring this up, Ryan, which is that you know Trace Jackson Davis got his numbers tonight. 21 points, 8 of 13 you know, from the field. He did some things offensively when Indiana needed him. But it's like he came alive when the ball was in his hands. And outside of that, this was not the Trace Jackson Davis that we've seen most of this year. Like there, I tweeted out at one point, like there was kind of a melancholy about his body yeah. language. He tonight. looked tired. He, yeah, he looked tired or sad or upset. Like he just didn't look like himself. No. And you can I think see he's that. Tired. Yeah, I mean, he, he may well have been playing 37 minutes. And, and you can see it in the stat sheet. Zero blocks, zero steals for Trace Jackson Davis. A guy that athletic and that instinctive, he's going to get steals and blocks when he's playing 37 minutes and really into it. And I thought for part of the game, you know, Race Thompson wasn't as energetic as we've seen him. And Here's, when those two guys what. when those two guys aren't bringing it full throttle, Indiana's going to struggle because they don't have anybody else down low. And so those guys did enough to win tonight. But Indiana's still going to need more from them. They, they weren't as good as we've seen them be. I'll tell you right now, Indiana's top six are exhausted. They've played a lot of minutes. And, you know, tonight was not a game where you were going to get Jordan Geronimo a, a, a decent amount of run. He, he came in and looked completely lost. I, I, I don't know if I can buy game. the the exhaustion stuff. I mean, like, Trace is playing 80% of the minutes. Armand, 75. Race, 70. Like, these guys aren't playing... Like you see, see other teams where guys are playing like 75, 80, 85 percent of the minutes. Sure. Do I'm really saying think- these guys are tired. I'm not comparing them to anybody else on the other team. I mean, because we saw them against Illinois struggle down the stretch. We saw them against Northwestern struggle down the stretch. We've seen I mean, whether 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 they're playing enough minutes or not, or whether the, the conditioning program isn't getting there. I don't know what the thing is. They're playing a lot of minutes and they're, it's not working well. And and so you know, it's not, it's not paying off well. There's not a whole lot of depth on this team. You're going to have to start force-feeding minutes in the first half to guys who maybe don't belong on the floor yet. I mean, I know Lander got a second foul tonight, but he's not going to play He's not going to play 30 minutes. Who cares if he gets a third foul? Like, you know, I mean, leave him in there for a couple minutes. Let him test it out. If he gets four fouls in the first half, who cares? He's not going to play in the second. You know, I, I really think that you need to start force-feeding some guys some minutes. And if it's five minutes here, three minutes there, four minutes there, all of those add up in the end. And so maybe, you know, don't have both of them on the floor at the same time, but maybe start trying to work some guys in because I'm sorry at Trace Jackson Davis. The first thing I thought was he's tired. He looks tired. He was cut. He was moving like he was tired. Now he toughed it out and played 37 minutes and good on him for doing that and being present enough to, to make plays when he got the ball. There were, there were a couple of times he grabbed offensive rebounds, but got fouled on the way up. And so, you know, that obviously knocks out the rebound. Um, but yeah, he wasn't he wasn't super active uh, on the on the offensive. I'm glass. just not, okay. I'm just not sure with him. I buy tired because we saw last year some games where he just kind of didn't look into it. Now it's he's better year. this year, so he can still score 20 points. But when it starts at the beginning of the game, he's not tired at the start of the game. I, so I'm just not see, sure I buy is, tired as the those games for. where he wasn't into it though. He would play differently than he did tonight. He'd play a little bit like he did at Illinois. He'd work angles. He'd go side to side. He'd maybe try and shoot a little bit. Like when he got the ball in the post, he was attacking tonight. Yeah. And and I just feel like when he does that thing where he's not into the game, he doesn't attack at all. And so that that was my perspective of it. Maybe he wasn't as into the game, but I'm saying it was a different look than we've seen before. Uh and and so yeah, I, I think that those guys are playing a lot of minutes. And Archie said early in the season. Yeah, it's concerning to be playing Trace and Race more than 35 minutes a game. He said that a couple weeks ago, and I agree. I mean, if it's if it's March Madness, 
and it's win or go home. Yeah. You got to play those guys as much as you need to win the game, but it is concerning this early in the season. We're not even in January yet. And these guys are already loading 35 plus minutes a game or in some of these games. And that's a lot. And, and I don't know. I just feel like these guys are especially, you know, playing Northwestern, then Illinois really close together. And then you get a couple of days off and then you play this one and you're right back out there for 35 minutes, 37 minutes, whatever it is. I just thought he looked tired. I thought a couple guys looked tired. I thought that that had a lot to do with the defense not recovering as quickly as it did. Now I'm tired. <laughs> I would say too. I mean, I think it might even be less physical and also, you know, partially mental fatigue, mental, well, mental in the sense that, you know, I, Jackson, he's young. He can play 40 minutes and he'll be all right. He's a professional. He's going to be a professional athlete very soon. At least professional now. Um, but, you know, where, where you're looking at is like they know they have nobody on the bench to come help them out. So, I mean, and tonight you had some guys coming, you know, Finnessy played well, now Durham came, came well. But it's got to be tough when you're Jackson Davis. It's like if you're having a rough night or it's just things aren't clicking or you see like, oh, God, Finnessy's not playing well tonight. It's like you know there's nobody off the bench who maybe can come and spell him. It's like you know Lander's not going to do it. Like you know that this is it. Like these, this is your ride and die, guys. And I can imagine that would get taxing after a while, five or six games in, where it's like I just had two games where – I did everything I could. And we know he was pissed after um, what was the loss? Um, the, uh, the Florida state loss. Like he was yeah. like, nobody helped me out in that one. Um, you know, and I think that's where it mentally gets taxing where it's like, you're, you're doing well. And then you see, you know, the, the turnovers, you see guys making the mistakes. And it's like, why are like, I'm doing everything I can against Penn state. And like, I need someone to show up. It's like, this is all I got. Like, there's nobody, well, you, know, <laughs> you know, and now, you know, Brooks not there to help. Door. Yeah. yeah. yeah Joey Brunk, sure. if you didn't see had back, yeah, Joey Brunk had back surgery, which is, I mean, that's a big loss for Indiana. I know we, you know, harp about the, the hedges and ball screens and things like that, but man, having him for 10, 15 Just minutes a game body. would be huge, huge, especially in a game like this. This is the type of game where I, I feel like Joey Brunk really would have helped when Trace and Race are struggling a little bit, don't quite have the energy. It's like the Minnesota home game last year. You know, Joey'd been struggling for weeks and he comes in and he, you know, wins that game just with energy and toughness and heart. So just to get him a few minutes to sit on the bench and watch, you know, I mean, like it, 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 you know, well, Joey and and Archie has tried to steal minutes for trace Jackson Davis this year. You know, he'll take him out with, you know, six minutes left and try and get him back in at the under four timeout. Sometimes it hasn't worked because there hasn't been a stoppage. And then you're trying to crowbar trace back in somewhere, but you know, he's been trying to steal minutes for him at times this year. You've seen that. And, and, He's he's wary of it, so I I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, Jordan Geronimo at some point is going to have to play minutes now with Bronk out. He's just going to have to. Um, I, I don't know. There's no other answer for that. But he's the only other guy who can potentially take a role, you know, in the low post and and eat some minutes. He's going to have to at some point. The the only thing I will say about Bronk is. Uh, just to go a little bit big picture, I agree with everything you're saying. It, it would be helpful. It would definitely help this team. But it's like big picture. Like, dude, if we're in year four of the Archie Miller era and we're going to like the entire season is now because Brunk got hurt. Like, that's why it's like, dude, Underwood's not having those problems in Illinois. Like everybody else in year four is able to get somewhere. So if like it's like, oh, because of Brunk's injury. No, it's not the entire. No, yeah, but, no, no, you don't make that hurt. excuse. But, yeah, it's, it's but not it an excuse. Yeah, it but it, it's a factor. Team. You know, I mean, anytime you lose a guy that was a key player and might have started and provided depth it's a, like you know what it does scott it just it provides no margin for error that's the thing and i that's why i feel like there's going to be a couple games indiana's going to lose because yeah. trace gets in foul trouble or just doesn't quite have it and those 10 to 15 or 20 minutes brunt could give you you just don't have and that's nobody's fault he's just hurt and you've got to try and find a way around it it means jordan geronimo's you know his development has to speed up jerome hunter has to show that he can guard somebody you know so you have to figure out a way to compensate for it but at the same time, it still hurts, you know. So the, yeah. I think we can, you know, you got to kind of balance those two things. Andy, what numbers? You did say out? something though that, like, uh, you know, J- Jackson Davis doesn't get in foul trouble. That is the one great thing about him is like yeah. that doesn't really happen. Yeah. Andy, any other numbers jump out to you? Well, Scott mentioned in the chat he had a couple things. So, I, uh, did you did you nah. get those in? Are you good? I I didn't. It's the, keep going. We're going long. I don't worry about it. All right. I, we're, I'm just trying to be a hospitable, uh, hospitable host. <laughs> I've um, got, oh, go ahead. You got o- one. Only thing, yeah. The, you know, points in the paint. Uh, I think I, you ended up with 50 uh, over the course of the game, and really early on, it was all all shots right at the rim and free throws because that was really what Penn State was giving. Uh, once they went to a zone, I used struggle with that at, at times and did hit a few threes in the second half. But um, yeah, I mean, 50 points in the paint, you'd feel pretty good about again. I think that's. Uh, 
some ways a function of IU, some ways a function of, uh, of Penn State's defense. And then, you know, blocks and steals, we talk about that a lot. Seven blocks in the second half uh, from IU, I believe, seven of the eight. Although the one that came in the first half was the one where race just obliterated that guy. And if ever there was a time that I felt like it was warranted that somebody could have stood over the guy that they blocked and taunted him without any without any uh, retribution from the official, I think that would have been it. But um, but luckily, he uh, he didn't do that. Yeah, I think the only one that I noticed was we're talking about Indiana's veteran guards stepping up and playing a big role. And, and maybe when they, they only hit six threes. So that means they were attacking. I mean, Al had four threes, but he had two buckets at the, uh, you know, uh, at the rim. Yeah. Uh, Finnessy only hit one three. He had four shots inside the three point line that went in. I mean, Indiana was legitimately attacking inside as, as Andy pointed out with the points at the paint and there were a couple pull-ups and things like that. So to uh, to be lauding the guards that much and have them only hit six threes means that they were really attacking and and sort of had a mentality to attack the rim or at least attack inside the three point line. They weren't just firing three pointers and and getting lucky that they go in. I guess my Scott, only number just continues to show that I'm always an idiot. It's like four minutes in, we're up like we're, we're up like fourteen eight or whatever. I'm like, oh, the live betting has like the over under for Indiana only to score seventy three and a half. I'm like, oh, easy. So I put money on that. I lose that. I bet Indiana plus seven, plus eight, plus nine with the spread. I lose all of those. So like, that's awesome. Indiana hasn't gone over 73 in like four games. And of course I bet it. So as always, don't listen to me. You dumbass. hundred <laughs> <100%. laughs> percent. It's a good note to end on for this segment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> coming up on the assembly call, we are going to hand out our game balls. Then we will hit any other lingering storylines. And then we will look ahead to Indiana's next opponent, which is Maryland. And then it'll be time for last call. That's next on the assembly call. Stick with us. Ron Davis. And what's the only thing better than dominating a Duke big man in the post? It's celebrated with friends afterwards. Join Gerard, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on the Assembly Hall call after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosiers. Thank you, Deron. You are listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night at our website, assemblycall.com. But by the way, not this Thursday night, because we are going to take New Year's Eve off. So then we'll be back with the Slacking. with the normal Thursday night shows after that. Uh, and while you're there at our website, assemblycall.com, make sure that you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 7,000 of your fellow IU fans have subscribed. You can also text IU to 66866 to subscribe to the newsletter. That's IU to 66866. All right, I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with Andy Bottoms, Ryan Phillips, and Scott Caulfield. We are breaking down Indiana's 87-85 to win over Penn State, a game so thrilling, so entertaining, that we just had to have a four-man crew for this show. It is time now, gentlemen, for the game balls. One of the most interesting game ball decisions of the season, I feel like. You could really go in a lot of ways. Um, so, Scott, you are the, uh, you're the guest here. We'll go to you first. I mean, fantasy is the easy choice. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have fun with this. And I'll let you guys actually. Oh boy. This, this is your show. I'll let you guys actually make a real decision. Um, no, I, this was going to go back to my, the, the points earlier. Like the, you know, Drum Hunter had four points. But here's what I'd say. He had one moment. Like, I'll give him a game ball for one moment that I like. Because I'm reading the chat mob. He's getting crushed for his defense. But here's the thing. He had one moment in the second half where – um, that dude for Penn State goes into him and like gets an easy layup. And you can tell he gets pissed. And like he calls for the ball and does the exact same thing back to him. Like shoulders in, great post. It's like, yes, like that's a drum hunter I want. And then he's like, All right, I'm done doing it for the night. Like now I'm just gonna go back to being bad on defense. And it's like if if Jerome Hunter could do that, like get more pissed and like be like, if he could just feel like he got pushed around every single play and just get pissed, like that's what we need. If Jerome Hunter could give us eight points like that a game and provide a little more defensive, like the, the the defense to put, you know, not just completely put it all on Davis. Like, so I know I'm making a joke of this and a mockery. I'll let you guys be serious, but that's what I do. You know, but honestly, like, that is like, I saw that one play by Drum Hunter. I'm like, that's, that's what we need, dude. Like Penn State's not a big team. Like he should be demanding the ball and asking for that. So it's like, Jerome, if you're listening, which you're not like do more yeah, of that, is. like get pissed. Okay. Jerome, 
I love you, man. Chat mob. They don't like you. Give it to Scott, man. No, I, that's the one play. I was like, dude, that was awesome. Like, we need more of that. He can do it. It just that's always like that's always been the issue with this team is for most guys. It's like they they can't lock in for 40 minutes like he locks in for three minutes and then it's like I'm going to take 12 minutes off. So yeah. that's my my very, very tongue in cheek game ball probably fits better in the coach Mike Roberts real hustle award, which we will go to next. But, you know, it does bring up a good point, though, because I did want to talk about those two post moves by Jerome. You know, he's a lot like Al where he's going to give up some on defense. So if he's out there, he's got to produce yes. points. And his three-point shot isn't going down, but he had a couple of mismatches today, took him into the post, and scored. And we've seen that intermittently from him. And if he can just kind of, to your point, if he could steal four to six points just on those little plays when he gets a mismatch, you know, that'd be huge for this team. Because this team has so much room to improve that anything you get in the margin offensively like that would really be key. So I don't think it warrants a game ball on a game when we've had five guys in double digits, but it's a good point. (laughs) I watched Jerome a lot. Okay, I'll tonight. give it to fantasy. I'll give it to fantasy. Done. <laughs> when when Jerome was out, you can't take back your game ball. Once no. you, it's in the books. No. Is Jerome? To, one, I will say I watched Jerome both ways a lot tonight. Now he did get beat on defense a few times. I thought as a four tonight, it might have been his best game actually playing the four. You know, because he's he's played some swing between the perimeter or whatever. Just it being in the right place and and making he made some really good passes. He had the one where. Uh, he, he went to short corner, got the pass, immediately threw it to Trace, cutting to the basket for a for a layup. I, I do think that as far as being a four, he played pretty well tonight uh, compared to some of the past performances. So that was not completely out of left field, Scott. I think that, that I noticed that too. 100% out of left field. Andy, your game ball. Please bring some sanity back to this segment. And then he's muted. Boy, this segment is just going Of course going he's great. muted. <laughs> So close. <laughs> uh, you know, well, I, we're closing was, out this uh, show as well as Indiana closed out the game. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm starting to get tired. I'm fatigued. It's uh, <laughs> it's almost it's almost midnight here. Uh, I'm going to go with Rob. I think you could make a case for Rob or Al. Uh, even Armand, he hit some big shots, but I'll uh, I'll go with Rob between the second half and overtime had nine points, three blocks uh, and a steal and uh, the game winner. So I'll, I'll go with him. I, I would certainly. Uh, listen to listen to arguments for the other perimeter guys uh, for sure, but uh, what was also just exciting to see you know Rob smiling uh, at various points during the game and um, you know making a big shot, which hopefully is is uh, boost to his confidence. Because Rob, Robbie Hummel, I think, even alluded to that as well that it was just a lot of you know kind of mental stuff that when he just you know gets the ball out and can get in transition a little bit and just let his instincts take over instead of thinking too much then he can really be there so uh i'll give him the game ball for the game winner and uh hopefully a springboard into uh into some uh continued improvement over the rest of the season yeah ryan who gets yours you know i i he's not my pick but i'm surprised he hasn't gotten love yet is trey galloway i'm surprised he hasn't got i'm surprised one of the first two guys didn't give 10 points four rebounds five assists led the team only one turnover in 36 minutes was also plus seven which was tied with trace jackson davis as the highest but I'm going with Rob Finnessy. You make that big shot at the end. The defense he played, the three blocks, as we've mentioned, were incredibly big. Uh, had a steal as well. He had a couple tie-ups, you know, where, where he really went in and, and helped the uh, fellow defender out. And then, yeah, 11 points for him, but he hit that big shot at the end. So I, I, it has to be Rob Finnessy tonight. I don't think there's – I think there are other guys that you could maybe give an honorable mention to, but he's, he's the clear choice. Yeah, you know, a guy like Trace Jackson Davis gets graded on a curve, you know, because he's the superstar. And, you know, he, I mean, look, 21 points, six boards, you know, he did some things that, you know, he hit a big free throw toward the end of regulation that sent it to overtime, even though he missed the second one that could have won it, um, you know, and, and got buckets when Indiana needed him. But I'm actually, I'm going to give mine to Al Durham. Um, and this is not just because I wrote about Al Durham this week and talked about how what Indiana needs from Al Durham, all it needs from Al Durham is just what Al has shown us that he can be. You know, it's like sometimes with Rob, we want Rob to be this all Big Ten point guard that we haven't actually seen. You know, we've seen it in the briefest of flashes from from Rob Finnessy, but never for an extended period of time. But if you go back to the last eight or nine games of Big Ten play last year, you know, Al Durham scored about 12 points a game, was really consistent as a as a point producer. And that's what Indiana needs from him. You know, just a reliable guy on the perimeter that you can pencil in for 11, 12, 13 points a game. Armand has certainly given Indiana some of that, but they've got to have it from Al. 
and we've seen him do it. That's why I think it's been very frustrating early this year. Now, I don't know if the ankle was hampering him or what, but he was out there, and the expectations for him are what they are. And tonight he did it. And, you know, at the two times when Indiana's offense was really going and Indiana built its big leads, as I mentioned in the meaningful moment, in the first half when they were up 29-20, and in the second half when they went up 12, who was at the center of it? It was Al Durham. Now, you know, again, they lost those leads, and I thought Armand and Trace did a great job of kind of saving Indiana's bacon at the end when everything else was going poorly, but Al was involved in two huge scoring outbursts for Indiana. That's the kind of guy that he's got to be, and so the mentality that he brought to the game tonight I thought was really good, and so, you know, to kind of see him bounce back from some of the struggles that he had, uh, he gets my game ball, but the official game ball goes to Rob, which, you know, look, when you hit the game-winning shot in the Big Ten an important Big Ten victory. I think it's well warranted for you to get that game ball. Uh, Mike Roberts Real Hustle Award. I think this one pretty easily is going to go to Trey Galloway, don't you think? For all the reasons that Ryan said. You know, it, just a guy who brings tons of energy. Uh, and, you know, again, I, I think the, the great thing about Trey and, you know, and, you know, Scott or Andy, if you want to jump in and say anything about Trey, you know, he obviously hasn't shown us the ability to make outside shots yet. But he just continues to improve on his recognition and decision-making when he drives in. And he is a guy, you feel better offensively when he's on the court because you always feel like, hey, you know, this is an offense that's so stagnant at times and is so disjointed at times and can look like five guys that just met up in the hyper and were surprised that the game before them ended so quickly, you know, and they're like scrambling around. Trey Galloway is kinetic and makes things happen on offense. And sometimes this team just needs someone that confidently makes things happen from the wing. And Trey does that because he's just always going 100 miles an hour. But now he's kind of starting to add some of the recognition with it. So, you know, we may just have to rename this award the Trey Galloway Real Hustle Award. But that's the kind of tone he sets. And that's important for this team, especially on a night like tonight when some of the leaders didn't have the energy that you're used to from them. Yeah, I think the the playmaking is just yeah we I feel like we've we've talked about this a lot over the various games but he's aggressive he's looking to make plays for others not necessarily for himself although he took you know smart shots I, I felt like tonight when the opportunity presented itself um but a guy that's not willing or that's not afraid to get into the teeth of the, de- the defense and try to make a play for somebody else and um you know when things get stagnant for this team as they can so often offensively like that's what's not happening um too much side to side dribbling and and not enough you know going toward the basket or trying to make something happen i think he's a guy that's really adept at that and um which is not to say he's going to be the the point guard of this team but there were times when it felt like all right well maybe he's what they need to initiate the offense and uh do some of those things so i think you know those kinds of just iq type things even watching him when the um then when Penn State played zone, you can just, you know, all those cliches about being the son of a coach and just being uh, really smart with what he was doing, knowing where he needed to be. That really showed itself in those stretches. The team didn't necessarily play all that well offensively against the zone, but you could just tell he had a really good idea of, of what he needed to do and how he could help set up other guys. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's a weird look, but if you look at like the games we've lost, it's the games where he has not played well. I mean, it's, it's not perfect, but you. I mean, he has you know four points against Illinois, six points against Northwestern. He only has an offensive rating of twenty seven against Florida State, at zero points. You know, he didn't play great against Butler, um, but we won that game. But for the most part, like you know, when he's playing well and providing you know eight to ten points and an offensive rating over a hundred, we're going to win. And so, I mean, it's in a weird way, he is kind of the key to getting everything going. He's also the guy that the most likely to get my award, like the dude I'm going to love watching for the next four years, like on a team that's kind of frustrating yeah. to watch at times. It's like you just you, you you're drawn to him like I am going to love having Trey Galloway in my life for four years. Yeah, he is. He had the first Chris Kramer uh, comparison today from Robbie Hummel. That was uh, that was inevitable coming from a Purdue guy. He'll be better than Chris Kramer. Come on. Yeah. Um, you know, look. Indiana's in trouble if Trey Galloway is our best playmaker for the rest of the season. He just that, that's just he, he is. That's not a knock on him. You just you have to be able to have other guys that are that are producing plays for others. But my God, we'd be devastated without him. You know, so he is really helping. And this leads to the last storyline I wanted to talk about tonight, which is well, Christian Lander. I, I pick I pick Galloway as well. Yeah, yeah, we're all picking Galloway. That all one right. was, and I'm not going to Let's Scott because sure. he'll pick like Jordan Geronimo or Anthony Leal or somebody for this one. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna. No, do I'm picking that. one of the cutouts, <laughs> one of the cutouts in the back row, one of the big. Soon I'll be there. <laughs> By the way, oh, that's right. Can look for me. The that's right. Um, last thing I want to talk about is Christian Lander. You know, he got his obligatory three minutes in the first half. Did not play in the second half. 
look, I'm on record with how I feel about this. I still would like to see him play more, but this is the first game in a while that I think you could make a reasonable argument for why he didn't play simply because the other guys actually played well. You know, and that's been my big frustration with why Lander's not getting minutes is like, well, if the other guys aren't producing, then you got to at least let him get out there and get some experience. You know, this game, he didn't do much with his minutes early, and the other guys really bounced back and played well in the second half. Again, I still say run him out there, get him some experience. But in an absolute, you know, as close to a must win as you can get for a late December, you know, third Big Ten game, once Rob and Al got going, you know, I kind of understand it. But, you know, it's still frustrating that our five star point guard continues to toil away on the bench. You know, and I know the easy thing to say is, well, he's not really doing anything with the minutes that he's getting. You know, sometimes it's tough to just get three minutes and be able to go out there and find a rhythm. So, but I don't have a huge quibble with it tonight because we won and the other guys played well. And that's always going to be your best argument for not giving him more time. This is why I hate recruiting, and we all should. Like, unless it's Zion Williamson, like all the summer, it's like you hear about, oh, Christian Lander. I'm going to go ahead and plug him in as our point guard. So you got Lander, you have Trey Sack and Davis. You usually have two of the best five guys in the Big Ten. Like, other people are talking all that stuff. It's like, to your point, Ar- Armand, um, Armand Franklin wasn't highly recruited. It's like, I, I, this is where I just don't know if it's like the scouting systems. Like, I don't know what it is, but it's like, no other no other five star point guard is like just toiling away on the bench. And so I don't know what's I don't know what's going on, but this is why I just I don't get into recruiting. So that's my soapbox. But it's like this is why I hate it's it. It's a happier like, life wanna, as a basketball fan, I feel yeah. like I, I want to wait until they're wearing an IU jersey and I can and I I can, you know, grade Evaluate them on them that. Yourself. Yeah. No, here and here's the thing. Development is just as important as important as recruiting, if not more so. Get all the five stars in the world. If they don't get better while they're on campus, they're just a good high school player. You know, I mean, it's great shots to get fired the big, at Kentucky. Well, it's great to get the big to get the big name recruits, but you got to make them better. You know, otherwise they're just dude who scored 20 a game in high school. So but but Lander also was a year younger than everybody. So, right. you know, it, it was always going to be a tough transition. Yeah. I agree with Jared. I think moving forward, they need to find areas to get he and Geronimo more time in, in games. I, I agree with that. And, and we argued about it a couple of weeks ago. But seeing how some of these guys are dragging and how it's affecting their defense, which is the most important thing to Art to Archie, they need to get him some more minutes just to steal minutes for guys and give guys a chance to take a breather sometimes. Yeah. Um, all right, Andy, let's look ahead. Maryland comes in. The 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 Terrapins not expected to do much this year, uh, but then came out and shocked the world by beating Wisconsin. So they are now 38th in Ken Palm, just another of the parade of Big Ten teams uh, that <laughs> you just look down the schedule and it's good team after good team after good team. Uh, you know, and I, you know, is Maryland good? I don't know. I guess it, it can be a kind of a semantic argument, but they're certainly good enough to come into Assembly Hall and beat Indiana if Indiana gives a B minus effort. So what do we, what should we expect from this game? Yeah, I haven't really had a chance to watch Maryland play too much this year. They hadn't beaten anyone in the top 100 of Ken Palm uh, before that Wisconsin game. So uh, that was that definitely feels like the uh, the outlier uh, so far. Just given um, you know, given who they played before that, they lost at Clemson by 16, lost to Rutgers at home by 14, and uh, then lost at Purdue by three. So um, you know, pretty. Pretty balanced team. They got six guys scoring at least eight points a game, and they don't really play. Uh, even if you look back at that Wisconsin game, they don't play a ton of guys. So uh, it, it's just a number of of players stepping into bigger roles that have been there for the last few years and uh, being asked to do a, a bit more. So the the names uh, will be familiar to people, but they they basically have everybody's between six five and six eight that really. Uh, play substantial minutes for them. So they don't have a ton of size, but they also aren't, are, you know, got some good length even in the backcourt. So uh, they're, they're 11th in offensive efficiency uh, so far. So uh, that's really, especially after the defensive performance from IU tonight, what to, uh, what to really monitor and, uh, and go from there. We owe them from last year. Gave that one away. By the way, uh, Al Durham just tweeted, shout out to the big man upstairs, though, always. I can't confirm that he was thanking me and the assembly call article that we wrote because I live in a single story house. I'm not technically upstairs, but some people are saying that that might be who he's referring to. You know, on the view of our uh, of our chat here uh, of our Zoom call, you're on the top. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) That's right. Technically, shout out to the big man upstairs. Right back at you, Al. Hey, you know, I've got I've got Al's back. No one will go down fighting for a senior guard like Jared Morris. Gosh darn it. And today, Al Durham proved me right. So I'm, I feel really good about that. 
Uh, all right, you're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Remember that you need to check out our friends at Home Field Apparel to get the perfect gift for the college sports fan in your life. Use the promo code Assembly20 at checkout to get 20% off your entire order. Gentlemen, it is time for last call. Scott, we will go to your first, your final thoughts on Indiana's 87-85 to 85 exhale victory over Penn State. Yeah, I mean, it was, like I said in the beginning part, it is they, they did just enough to get biased, the bare minimum. Again, I, I don't want to go all macro on this, but, you know, as I look at where we're at, like, this is always what bugs me is like, so Ken Palm is not the end all be all, but we're projected to finish nine and 11 in the Big Ten again. So maybe we'll, we'll you know, Ken Palm, his projections are not exactly always what's going to happen, but that's where we're at. Like this, this was to me, he, it's a must win, obviously, but you did it in such a, a, a tough way. And again, you look at it like in you know the first three years, we were nine and nine in the Big Ten, eight and twelve in year two, with a losing twelve or thirteen streak, which was a lot of fun to go through, and then nine and eleven last year. And so the point that I always make is that you you know there's there's circumstances, there's injuries, like all of that stuff is there, but you've underperformed in three years, and so now you're at a point where it's like I need you to overperform. For, for a good amount of time. You can't just go nine and 11 or 10 and 10. Um, and that's where it's like, this is, this game is kind of like a micro of the macro. It's like, this was, I love, would have loved to see us just beat down Penn state, you know, while also, you know, covering my under, but no, you know, beat down Penn state and, you know, win by 10 or 15, you know, come out and hit a bunch, you know, just look like, all right, you know, we, we laid the smack down and we're ready to go in and take care of Maryland as opposed to like we all eked out. It's like, Oh my gosh, it, do we really have to do a post game tonight over this? Um, and, but it's like, this is, this is the trouble that I have with the micro and the macro is like, at some point we can't just keep underperforming and then just do the bare minimum and be like, all right, well, good. We're, you know, we're still a 500 team in year four. It's like, we, we got to start overperforming and we got to start overperforming in these games. And then we got to start overperforming in the big 10 and then we got to start overperforming in the big 10 tournament. So like I'm taking it big, but it's like, th- that is, that's my main takeaway is like, this is, the problem that we've had for a while now is we're kind of just always eking by with just enough. We got to get more. And it's going to start with guys like Finnessy and Al Durham and Galloway doing what they did tonight on a very consistent basis. And if that happens, we're a solid team. The problem is the consistency. So we got to see that, but you know, we got it tonight. We got to win, you know, cliche time. A win is a win. You know, every, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's a record book, yada, yada, yada. But, but now like, let, let's, let's go beat Maryland. Let's go beat Wisconsin. Let's go beat Nebraska. And let's get a little run going here. I like it. All right. Thank you, Scott. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have some sad breaking news here in the, in the chat. Uh, Ryan's girlfriend, Madeline is making dinner and she's having to reheat it because the show is taking so long. So yeah. cue the sad violin and let's cue up Ryan's last call so he can get to dinner because she might have to, reheat it again i mean it's 9 15 and i haven't had dinner yet so you're lucky you got me this long andy lives uh, on the east coast he's not well, he, not concerned he about the had time. food today though right it's let's not delay this any longer with the sad music okay uh <laughs> so uh, indiana won tonight and you could see the relief in the players faces when that buzzer went off and they were very excited and very happy to get off the schneid in the big 10 and win a game when the previous two games, they probably had a chance to win. It didn't play well enough to win uh, down the stretch, especially so good. They got to win the veteran guards, the upperclassmen guards stepped up, uh, but this team is still a work in progress has a lot of improving to do. And we went over it in this show. The defense has to be better. The offense needs to flow better. And when it does flow, it actually works. And it looks like these guys are kind of enjoying playing together and stuff. All credit to Rob Finnessy and Al Durham for stepping up tonight. That cannot be a, they can't take a breath now though. They need to continue that. Indiana needs to be a team that gets multiple guys in, you know, double figures. And it's not Trace Jackson Davis with 20 something Armand Franklin with 15 and then everybody else with two, they need to have multiple guys playing and playing well and scoring and then also doing it on the defensive end. So this has to be a game where they say, okay, we like what we did on offense. We got clean up a lot on defense and it, you don't get a day off in the big 10. The next game is coming and Maryland's going to be tough. Just like Penn state was tough. Just like Illinois was tough. Just like Northwestern was tough. So uh, this is a 20 game season and you are three games in and you better start pushing even, even harder because it's not going to get easier. Andy, 
Last call. Ryan, thank you for your service tonight, for your sacrifice. We appreciate it. Ryan, what's for dinner? <laughs> it's a uh, salad and uh, some some uh, leftover meat from Christmas. Oh, very good. Let's say you don't reheat salad, but all filet right. Mignon, filet mignon, mignon roast and some mashed potatoes. Oh, filet mignon. All right, game ball goes to Madeline. I change it. Sorry. Yeah. Later, Can guys, your mom bring some tiramisu? We did have that for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Later, guys. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you know, for, from my perspective, you had a couple of things that were, I don't know, or went differently tonight than they've gone over the course of the season. I mean, the defense was for a prolonged stretch, not what we had come to expect from, from this team so far. And that was on the negative side. And on the positive side, you had the kinds of contributions from Al and Rob that everybody had really been pining for. Uh, so far and that Archie had talked about and everything else. So it now becomes a question as you move forward of what, what there's one of those things that obviously we hope goes back to where it was before. And another one that we hope, you know, builds on what it was tonight. And I think that as you look forward to the Maryland game will be, you know, the first thing that I'll look at uh, is just, does the defense get back to some semblance of what it had been for you know, most of the season thus far? And, does this really become a springboard for Rob from a confidence perspective that he can get going? And if you're able to, to do those things, then the outlook gets a, a decent bit rosier. Um, there's certainly reasons to believe that, 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 that that's not the way that this is going to go. But um, if we're looking to be optimistic, I think that's what you look at. You, you see those guys get confidence to play well, and you may continue to have a really short rotation but if you're getting contributions from, you know, if it's a seven man rotation, you're getting good contributions from everybody, which really tonight in large part, I'd say was true. You had uh, multiple guys in double figures and, and race and Jerome were not, but, but still made some contributions. You got some really good performances out of seven guys and you can look to build on that, hopefully work some other guys in. And, and that makes, I, I guess, being forced to play maybe a shorter rotation, uh, a bit more palatable as you as you go forward. So, uh, I'll I'll be optimistic and hope that uh, that this becomes the the first of a, a number of good games for them because uh, backcourt play is so important in college basketball, and you felt good going into the season because you had veteran guys there that just hadn't given you uh, you know, had really been outperformed by Armand Franklin, who was the surprise and a pleasant surprise at that the the leap that he's made. And so, if you can add. Uh, you can add the the veteran presence of those guys and some improved play from them. So what you got with Armand, I think that stabilizes a part of this roster that that there have been to not feel great about uh, so far during the season. So this was hopefully a, one where they turn the corner, and uh, we'll find out on Monday, I guess it is, uh, yeah. whether they can uh, keep that going against Maryland. Doing these shows is always such a, a cathartic and sometimes revealing uh, experience. I always enjoy the shows, and sometimes my mindset when the show starts is a little bit different after it ends, and we've had a chance to kind of talk through it. And I have to say, I was pretty despondent sitting on the couch watching the end of that game, just watching the 12-point lead slip away, watching us and Penn State just kind of stumble our way through that overtime. I mean, you know, we looked like poorly coached, kind of fatigued teams, both of them, you know, but... Ultimately, we won, and I do think it is important in a conference season that is as tough as this one to, you know, acknowledge and appreciate the wins, and it's hard to win these games, and Indiana did win it. You know, I I think you could very easily take a glass half full, glass half empty look at this one. There's a lot of positives to take from the offense, I think. You know, this is, you know, Penn State represents one of the worst defenses in the league, so this is what Indiana should do against a defense like that, and they did it. And that's good. And if you can get anything like this from Alan Robb sustained moving forward, you know, that, that really kind of changes the calculus for how good this team can be. Maybe they can go back to being the team that, that you know, the more optimistic people thought that they could be uh, in the offseason. But certainly the defense, you know, leaves you with some concerns. But ultimately, this was a huge game tonight for Indiana to win because a loss would have been disaster, no matter what kind of loss. Blowing a 12-point lead in the second half would have been real disaster. And so you averted that and you got to win over a team that has shown a pulse that has beaten, you know, some other top 75 teams. So, you know, I think we can all exhale. We can look for the positives that we saw in the offense and hope that it's a building block. You know, that's what this game needs to be. You know, it's never a good sign to win one of the easiest games on your schedule in overtime 
when because when you just look at all the other difficult games out there, it's like, well, shoot, if it took us to overtime to win this one at home, what are we going to do in these other ones? But if we can build on it, and some of this offense carries over, and we return to the more connected, tight, you know, strong defense that we've played, then maybe this is a stepping stone to better things. And if it is, then we can look back at this as, wow, that was a, you know, that was a tough one. Glad we won it because then it springboarded us to this. And so that is a thought that I'm going to carry with me tonight. The Hoosiers are one and two off the schneid in the Big Ten. Uh, and hopefully it's something to build on and, uh, you know, as we move forward in this season. All right, that is going to do it for us on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assemblycall, and don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to longtime listener Bob Thompson, who produces a lot of the music that you hear on the show, and thank you for listening. We'll be back to talk IU hoops again with you Monday night after IU Maryland. In the meantime, have a great uh, New Year's Eve. Until then... Take it from me, James Blackman Jr. Keep your elbows in, eyes on the rim, and get buckets. Go Hoosers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right, I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. I don't like carrots. (sighs) Okay, gentlemen. All right, thanks, man. Yeah, it's 1230, so I'm going to go reheat some salad. Can I play my favorite Scott Caulfield drop real quick? Uh, do you know Tom do you Coverdale know? is a new James Harden? Coverdale is like a real early James Harden. <laughs> we just need Coverdale now to like push out of whatever law firm he's working and be like, dude, I want the hell out of here and then start going to strip clubs. <laughs> He'll really be the next James Harden. Uh, he's got coronavirus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was back at the beginning of all this, all this mess. Uh, what was what was yeah. that? What was that from? I don't know. You were joking like someone wasn't on the show, so you were joking that like maybe they had coronavirus or something, I think. I don't know. Well, no, there was a there was a rewatch that we did. It was like the ninety two Elite Eight game where a guy like had like had the flu and they're like, Oh, oh that's right. like yeah, that's it's right. like, Oh my god, like this is like he's out with coronavirus. Like ninety two, right. you guys yeah. are so ahead of it. Oh my god, he's got the like, virus. Oh my god, they should social distance. Like, what's going on? Why are they playing the game? Uh um, yeah, happy oh, New Year's sorry, Eve. I, to everybody yeah sorry to me to make it a four-man booth i thought you needed an extra so no well sorry. we did and then i my mind has been scattered in like a thousand different directions so i just forgot but no it was fun this was uh, this was a good game to have you on here it would have yeah. i really would have cussed a lot if we would have lost to penn state we all would have cussed a lot so thank you rob finnessy <laughs> no that would have been disaster yeah. like it it would have been i think you know we were texting about this earlier today like if we lost this game it would have been a well-warranted meltdown and I wouldn't have, I would not have blamed anybody for melting down because if you're zero three in year four, losing games like this, like you just can't do it. So they won, and all credit to them. Sometimes you just got to win by the skin of your teeth, any way that you can get it, because yeah. it goes as a win in the ledger. So it's a good thing they did. Well, I gotta say, I, I agree with Andy. I, I, I like having Happy Rob back. Like I just, I, I hate. Yeah. He's so he seems so happy when he's happy. He's got the dimples. Like he's just such a nice looking kid. That's like I just I hate to see him when he's like not doing well. I mean, I, I think, know it sounds weird, but it's like it's just like it's like no, he deserves. It's, like, it, yeah, it's sad. What you know? You think back to how he was as a freshman after that Butler. Well, no, just like his first seven or eight games as a freshman, he seemed so dynamic, and he's really never gotten back to being that guy. It's like ever since the concussion and the other injuries he's had, he's constantly overthinking, and sometimes it's kind of sad watching him because you know there's a better player in there, and he's just overthinking everything. And tonight, to see him actually be instinctive, it was just. You know, like collectively, the IU fan base, I can't remember another player that we've all just wanted to be good so bad and like, yeah. er, like trying to will it to happen. Everybody likes him and roots for him. So I think everybody enjoys, you know, him especially seeing him play like this tonight. So. All right. I got I to gotta run. It's almost 12. Yeah. Is, uh, is Jen reheating your dinner now, Andy? No. Absolutely. <laughs> she's, she's asleep. I ate, I ate, we ate, we ate a long time ago. I might need a snack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely not dinner time. Uh, All right, right, everybody. Let me know when you need me again. Sure. Yeah. Have a happy, safe New Year's Eve, everybody. Yeah. Go on you. Talk to you in 2021. Yeah. All right. See you all. Later.